Hello and welcome to episode 134 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, EV chargers outnumber gas stations 10 to 1 in Manhattan. Same ratio as rats to people. Interesting. Nissan has finally released pricing information for their Aria EV. Said a Nissan spokesperson, we know James Winningham has a Nissan Leaf, so we wanted to make sure the Aria was out of his price range. Canadian doctors expose blatant greenwashing by the Canada Gas Association. This after they turned to the left and coughed without being asked. A former coal power plant has been selected as the site for a fusion energy project in the UK. The power source of the past meets the power source of the... Never? Oh, that and more on this edition of The Clean Energy Show. And... And also this week, Brian, we have uh, the Tesla Semi is finally entered into production, if you can believe it. Uh, Pepsi, December 1st, so that's interesting. Porsche is going public. I didn't know they weren't. And how much space would solar panels take up to power the entire world? How was your trip to BC? I saw you took a yeah, trip. Yeah, it was great. So I this is my first time on an airplane in about six years, oh if my. you can believe it. Yeah. How much did it, it cost? Yes. How much did it cost? Oh, money's not I, I, I didn't book the ticket, so I don't remember. Okay. But, um, yeah, the planes were all full, um, pretty much full. Really? Masked and, or unmasked? Uh, I would say 5 to 10% masked. That's in the it, on a plane? Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah, so the, the restrictions in Canada just were lifted uh, just at the start of the month, I think. And, uh, yeah, everyone's pretty much given up on it already. Oh, brother. But uh, so far, I'm not sick, so uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, first time on an airplane, it's, it's, it, it was weird to go back on a plane. Um, but yeah, I went to BC, went to Whistler for a family function. But um, so we flew into Vancouver. And a couple of things. First of all, the Vancouver airport has these giant signs up about how they're going to be carbon neutral by 2030 at the Vancouver airport. They have a specific plan, I guess, to do that. I, I assume that doesn't include the airplanes. I assume not. Maybe the toilets. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, What? so a shuttle picked us up at the airport and drives us up to Whistler, which takes a couple of hours. But So you have to drive through Vancouver on the way to Whistler. And, yeah, I just wanted to give an update because so the last time I was in Vancouver was about two years ago when we, we talked about it then on the podcast. And back then, two years ago, there were quite a few Teslas on the road in Vancouver. The number now is insane. Like there is so many Teslas on the street in Vancouver. I just like I couldn't believe it. Within two minutes of driving out of the airport, I'd seen a dozen Teslas. Wow. Wow. And then it just continued the whole time and including up to Whistler because uh, it's mostly people from Vancouver. But uh, yeah, it was shocking. Like there were so many, I stopped counting almost immediately because it was it was too many. And I thought, well, I'm going to need some kind of comparison. So maybe I'll start counting BMWs and I'll, you know, to get some sort of a sense. Um, so this is not scientific or anything. And I didn't write down the numbers or anything, but I would guess there's two to three times more Teslas in Vancouver than there is BMWs. Wow. Yeah. It uh, was a lot harder to spot a BMW. And then I thought, okay, well, I've got more time to drive through. So I started counting Toyotas Yeah, because that's, you know, obviously a very uh, popular brand. And it looked kind of equal to me, like the same number of Toyotas as Tesla's in Vancouver. Oh, that's how many. Look out, Toyota. Yeah. So again, that's not scientific. I didn't keep track. You know, if anybody knows the actual numbers, but it, it's certainly going to be high in Vancouver, which is, you know, this is the West Coast of Canada. It's, it's, you know, it's near Seattle. It's got a similar vibe to Seattle. The whole West Coast of North America is, I assume, where there's the highest concentration of, of Teslas. But still, it was pretty darn shocking to see so many. And quite a few Mustang Mach-E's I saw as well. Yeah, those are, I, I want to get to that in a minute, but there's actually seems to be fairly good supply of those. I know you're always yeah. saying, well, how many of these things are you going to make and when are you going to make them? Yeah, uh, Ford seems to be coming through. So we'll get back to that in just a second. Um, I just, uh, it's, I can't believe it's been two years since you drove out in your Tesla. Like uh, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Time is, uh, I don't know. Time is meaningless in the, in the <laughs> pandemic, but, uh, I wish I wasn't aging because I know it hasn't uh, forgotten my body. It's aging quite well. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, and then, so once we were in Whistler, um, this is a mountain town, like a ski town, and it's not ski season yet, but um, they have these uh, tramways you can take up the mountain, the, um, what do you call it, gondola. Yeah. And so they have one now that's called the Peak to Peak Gondola. So you take the first one up the mountain, and then you switch to the Peak to Peak Gondola, which takes you from the peak of one mountain to the peak of another. And it was absolutely insane. This is apparently the longest span in the world of one of these uh, gondolas. Like, there's, you know, the, the, the gondolas are held up by these poles every, you know, every, in, you know, split up against the thing. Uh, so there's a, there's a handful of support poles at each end, but then there's a massive span in the middle, which is you just spend five minutes on this one uh, span of the, of the cable. It was just, it was crazy. It seemed like it shouldn't exist. Is that the one that was cut by vandals twice? Yeah, I'm not sure. There was, there was a news story in Canada a year or two ago um, about that. I'm not sure which one it was, yeah. But it was in Whistler. I think it was in Whistler. Oh, it was. I yeah. couldn't remember where it was, yeah. So I went up one, uh, in Banff National Park, I went up on one, which was kind of a, the one right near the town of Banff, which was nice view, but then you go back down. Another, yeah. I went to the other one at Sunshine, and they had just started doing it. And I guess the number of people doing it doubles every year, and I was on year three, so it wasn't too crowded, but I imagine it mm -hmm. is now. But it was it was a summertime thing to do where they just decided, hey, let's make some money in the summertime. And you go up in these mountain vistas, which are just full yeah. of wildflowers and just so peaceful and so stunning to just walk, to go for a hike for an hour or an hour. Yeah. I mean, there was a ton of tourists kind of spoiling it all. But aside from that, just absolutely. If you could just poison uh, them or something, you know. Just... <laughs> yeah. But the engineering feat of this gondola, like the peak to peak, yeah. it was just it was just crazy. How much it did it cost? Because like that'll tell you how much um, engineering went into it. It was about. It's about seventy dollars a person. Oh, well, that's not bad. That yeah. seems like a typical gondola ride, actually. Yeah. Hmm. How long did it take? Uh, the peak to peak takes eleven minutes. Is that all? The first one takes a little bit longer, I think. Oh yeah. Well, that sounds. Well, there's pictures, right? You must be pictures. Uh, yes, but it's an audio <laughs> podcast, so I didn't bring it. Oh, well, I'll describe them. I'll paint a picture for the listeners. <laughs> I got That's my right. Nissan Leaf fixed, and, you know, we were talking about this last week, and it wasn't going well for James. Not well at all. They yeah, wanted $1,400 for something that was supposed to be what I thought would be $500. Basically, I determined that it was a bearing in my front wheel. And in this case, it's a hub of bearings that needs to be replaced, but you got to take quite a few things apart and use torque wrenches. And I watched a guy do it on YouTube, thought about doing it myself. Uh, it cost me $2,100. Oh, ouch. They said that the sensor, the speed sensor in the ABS brakes on the wheel was seized and you need to take that out. Now, when I watched the video, the guy said, don't forget to take out the ABS sensor or you'll break it. So I'm thinking... <laughs> Those mother broke assholes it. broke it <laughs> and charged me 600 bucks. And I couldn't find one for 600 bucks, Brian. As hard as I tried, the most expensive one I found was 250 American, hmm. Hmm. which would be a little over $300 in our currency in Canada. And I found some for $25. I found a whole bunch for $25. So do you think you should have attempted this yourself? No, but <laughs> I really hate auto mechanic shops, really hate them. Well, it's just so difficult to know. I mean, they can tell you really almost any price and you kind of have to pay it. So what do you do? I know. I mean, it's, it's like I I was losing sleep over it and it was so angst. I just said, okay, I'm putting it on my credit card. I'll pay it off as I go. And there'll be interest and this sucks. But um, yeah, that's what I have to do. Uh, our government, our, our local government sending us 500 bucks at the end of November or so or something like that for, for inflation, <laughs> and I'll put that on it. Yeah, but yeah. I also have this kid going on this trip, and, you know, I, it just it was a bad time. However, as you were saying last week about your ceiling that you spent a lot of money on, you don't yeah, get anything for that. No, and they're back today working on the other half, so again, you might hear some <laughs> construction noise in the background. Well, I am really thrilled because I forgot what my car was like before this problem slowly yeah. emerged like a frog yeah. in hot water mm -hmm. uh, it was it's so i've fallen in love with my car again and i i just love electric cars so much and it's just it's yeah. it's so quiet 
you get up to like uh, city speed and you start to hear the wind and I don't hear anything else. I expect to hear something else, but all I'm hearing is a slight breeze. And this car does a really good job in um, sort of uh, mitigating the air noise. So uh, one of the channels I watch on YouTube is uh, out of spec reviews. You know, I'm, I've been talking to our R and D department at the Clean Energy Show, possibly mm -hmm. looking at a YouTube related segment. What James saw on YouTube. You know, we're talking <laughs> yeah. about it. They're they're crunching the numbers and, and and running some algorithms. Oh, I can tell you what I saw on YouTube when I was in Vancouver. Sure. The ads were a lot of them were from uh, BC Hydro, their electric utility. Yeah. I kept getting BC Hydro ads on my YouTube, and it was things like. Hey, everybody, did you know BC Hydro is all like 98% carbon free and free, you know, uh, hydroelectric power, everybody. But it's, you know, it's a government monopoly. So I'm, I'm not really sure why they're advertising, but it was still interesting to see. And of course, the algorithm knew that that was, I guess, an ad that I might be interested and in. And you were. And you've talked <laughs> was, about BC yeah. Hydro on the show before. Yeah. Uh, anyway, there's a, an automotive review channel I watch. Now, when I watch automotive review channels, it's to watch about EVs because that's what mm -hmm. I'm interested in. I'm interested in buying them. I'm interested in learning about them. And Out of Spec Reviews is a guy in um, just outside of Denver. He uh, does all these reviews. I like him. I've grown accustomed to him. I trust him. He does a fairly honest uh, review. So he went, he decided he, he's been having you know, all these cars come out of his orbit, right? Lots of different cars. And he's always interested in cars, combustion and otherwise. Well, he decided to buy a Nissan Leaf. And he bought one, the cheapest one he could find in America. And it was eh, $4,700, $3,700, something like that. Wow. And it had a dent in it and the battery was bad and the, the level two charger didn't work. Like the, the normal charger that you would charge at home didn't work. So, so only the fast one. Only the fast charger works. Uh, and it was an SL version, so it's the higher trim level. So it's got all the, you know, it's got a solar panel that charges the, the battery. And not the battery battery, but the 12-volt battery. 12-volt. Which is good to keep topped up in, char in cars like that that use, you know, uh, batteries for connectivity and stuff like that. And uh, he's just, he's driven it for a couple of weeks and here's a clip because he really likes it. You know, we spend a, spend a lot of our time evaluating cars on the bleeding edge of technology. For example, this week I've been driving the Model S Plaid, the Lucid Air Grand Touring, doing range testing and things like that. The Rivian R1T, the Mercedes EQE. That's all great. But I think also I'm just a fan of transportation in general. It doesn't need to be expensive bleeding edge transportation. Things like this can get the job done for most people, or for at least many use cases. I just wanted to tell you that for $3,750, I got reliable electric transportation that is actually really fun to drive. So I'm pretty pleased with this whole thing. Yeah, he doesn't have to buy this crappy old car, yeah. which is now ancient in EV terms. It's yeah. two years older than mine. It's a 2011. He towed it wow. in a Rivian. <laughs> he was like, got a hold of a Rivian, so he went to Seattle to Denver towing this thing. And he's going to make a video about that as well. And, well, I, I, he's just quite happy with it, and you can see him driving around on his channel. So, yeah, I just really love the car, Brian. No, and, and as we've said, though, it is a city car. You can't really expect to do uh, uh, road trips on no. it. But, of course, 99% of the time, you're just driving around town. And obviously it works for you and, and for lots of people. Because we're a two-car family, actually three if you count our vacation vehicle that remains parked most of the year. Uh, we have the car that we can use for vacations, you know, we are longer yeah. term. We just went to, um, you know, two and a half hours, the kids in college type of thing. And we can make that trip several times a year and any vacations we want to. And uh, we don't have to worry. All our cars don't have to be highway worthy. And this yeah. car is doing such a great job and saving us a ton of money. And coming up on its 10th birthday, by the way, in January, we'll be celebrating that on the show. Yeah, so I wanted to mention the Nissan Aria then, which really is the follow-up to the Leaf. Like, Nissan had a, a huge head start in EVs with the Leaf, you know, uh, over 10 years ago. But it's taken them this long to 12 come years, up with Brian, 12. <laughs> 12 it's years. It's ridiculous. And... Uh, so they are. They finally have a follow-up. It's the Aria, and uh, pricing has been announced. So you, as a Nissan Leaf driver, this might be the natural, uh, you know, car for you to upgrade to. Um, but I don't know. Might be out of your price range. Fifty-three thousand Canadian, 
And in the U.S., it's that's around forty-three or forty-two, I think, as the starting price. Yeah, well, it's almost uh, eighteen thousand more than what I want to spend. So yeah. that's a lot. Yeah, that's a, that's a large percentage, and it's not worth it. I don't think it's worth it. I've read the reviews, including out of spec reviews, by the way, and it mm -hmm. just doesn't seem like the best value out there because it's pretty close in price to say a Hyundai Ioniq Five which charges um, very fast, like ridiculous, yeah. faster than anything but a Tesla, really. And, you know, Porsches and some things like that. But for most of the cars out there, like the Fords don't charge very fast. They've got this 800 volt architecture and it charges fast. And Mike, my friend Mike, he's gonna give me a test drive one of these days, yeah. aren't you Mike? And he's got one in town. But I also saw other people talking about you can't get one of those anymore for two or three years. Like, that's what they're being told. I don't know if it's a lie, because right, I don't trust right. dealers to tell the truth. I don't trust anyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll see. And by the way, you, you, did you used to watch This Old House on PBS ever? Oh, I love This Old House. Love it. I don't know why I did, but I did. And, you know, oh, yeah. we used to have just a handful of channels, and one was that, and maybe there was nothing on, and I just fell into it. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've picked up some things and done my own, you know, it's probably got me started on my own DIY projects and, and just that path in life. Yeah, and they occasionally do cover things like, energy efficiency, like insulation and heat pumps and stuff like that. So I still check them out on YouTube occasionally when they have uh, stories about that because, you know, they'll be upgrading an old house and it's like, well, how do we bring it into the, the 21st century and, and make it, you know, energy efficient. But, you know, I started watching with Bob Villa, Villa? Bob Villa, Villa. yeah. I, yeah. I've forgotten his name. It's been 20 years since he's been on the air. Yeah, he hasn't been on for a decade. But he started in the 70s, in the very late 70s, and all through the 80s. And, you know, I'd, on a Saturday afternoon, you were bored, James. You'd kind of just turn on the TV and sort of fall into something. <laughs> and, uh, well, they, after all these years, they're doing EV chargers. I mean, I was dreaming about EVs when the show went on the air. And mm -hmm. now they're talking about EV chargers. Hey, Heath. Hey, Kevin. Electric vehicle charging, huh? Yeah. So in terms of safety, uh, you know, obviously this is the port where it goes. When, yeah. you know, the 17-year-old goes chasing the 14-year-old. <laughs> and wants to zap him. Be able to zap him? Is that is possible? No. No? No. So this part is energized. When it comes out of here, it goes into the unit. Just this cord here. Just that cord. This piece, nothing. Really? Nothing at all. Until you plug it in. So it has two little pins inside that it wants to see contact the car, the car needs to know that it's made connection, then this will send power through. Yeah, you can stick your tongue on the end of my EV charger, the driveway. It's oh, not yeah. turned on. It's got to oh, communicate yeah. with the car. It's got to shake hands with the car and then throw okay. a switch to send the power. Okay, so they're advocating that people should lick their EV No, I'm not Is saying that. that. <laughs> do not do this at home, kids. I'm just saying there's there's so much ridiculous speculation out there about, yeah. you know, like charging cars in the rain and things. Come on. It's not yeah. like I'm, you know, taking a high voltage wire off of a, a transmission line and then, you know, sticking it to my car with rubber gloves. It's uh, it's all sealed and safe otherwise, uh, you know, and it's, of course, ground fault interrupted and all that. So yeah. that's the way EV chargers are. That's the way it has to be. And the straight pipes, our friends over the straight pipes, we interviewed one of the straight pipers, uh, yeah. favorite channel of yours. They did the F-150 Lightning. Did you see that video? They put I out? did, yeah. That was uh, a, a great review. I'm glad they finally got their hands on one. Yeah, they did. But my point of this is that they got their hands on one. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't given to them for a review. Uh, I, like, you know, I was talking last week that I keep seeing these at dealerships or at least listed at dealerships. It seems yeah. like, to your point about how many are you making and when are you making them, that, yeah. you know, Ford is uh, sticking up. They're, they're doing their thing. They're putting out these mach -E's. They're putting out the F-150s. They're actually making them. Making them Yeah, available. I've seen them listed on dealerships too. It tends to be the more expensive yeah. ones. So maybe they are having trouble selling those like super high priced ones. But um, we do expect EV prices to eventually come down. But unfortunately, they are still... Uh, pretty crazy expensive. You know, we just talked about the Aria. It seems like it's really priced higher than it should be. But I think we're a year or two away for, from prices actually, you know, finally starting to come down. But it should happen once uh, supply increases. Well, the straight pipes were really happy to find one. 
And where did we get this F-150 Lightning from? Meadowvale Ford. Thank you guys so much for providing the car because we couldn't get one through Ford Canada. If you're in Mississauga and you're looking for a Ford, only go there. They're going to have a bunch of Lightnings for you guys to buy. Mississauga, Ontario with a bunch of Lightnings to go buy. Now, these yeah. are longer range stuff. So this is the, it should be popular. People who can afford them. Yeah. And... and Last week, of course, you, you made a commercial for the, the Riverbend Co-op because they've been so nice about the charging infrastructure. So I guess this week it's the commercial for Meadowvale Ford. <laughs> yeah, we're constantly giving, get your free commercials here on the Clean Energy Show. <laughs> Last night, I got a DM from a friend, a mutual friend. We'll call him Trevor Aikman. Um, <laughs> that's his code name. Uh, <laughs> smart, thoughtful fellow. Yeah. Uh, was uh, fell into the FUD. He he fell into somebody telling him, you know, don't buy EVs because he's thinking about it. He was told yeah. by a friend not to because of the batteries, because the batteries yeah. are an environmental uh, terrorism. And yeah. I don't know how to address that. I mean, uh, the people listening to the show have already seen the re, you know the the studies. There's been many. Yeah. Some of them have been less kind than others. But if you see a study that says batteries are bad or EVs are worse than gas cars. Uh, usually that study is not well to wheel. It just, the gas magically shows up in the yeah. car and yeah. they say, they tell you how the, the coal was made for the electricity, but they don't tell you how the gas was mined, shipped, um, Sh transformed shipped truck. and, yeah. you know, more energy than it takes to drive just to turn that into gasoline at the refinery and then ship to yeah. you as well. And there is, to be fair, a carbon footprint for making an electric car. Um, so, you know, you can't discount that argument entirely, but, um, you know, compared to a gasoline car, it's night and day. It's not even a, it's not even a discussion. EVs are just uh, way better. I mean, the best thing to do is to walk, to ride a bicycle, to take public transport. I always like to throw that in there. Uh, but if you're going to buy a car, EV, way, way better. Yeah. And, and I've, I've said this a million times and I'll say it again. Uh, if there was no climate problem. I'd still be jonesing for an EV because they're better. Yeah, they're better. They're, better. they're way better. Yeah. They're even better <laughs> in cold weather. Like this, my Nissan Leaf is better in cold weather. I don't know about all cars, but my Nissan Leaf is just toasty warm and yeah. just a delight to drive in minus 40. <laughs> Believe it or not. And then there's videos on our channel, on our YouTube channel to, to see that. So uh, Clean Technica um, was talking about how Tesla is using approaches from other self-driving players that... Um, Basically, they haven't come up with everything themselves. They're using certain bits and pieces of uh, technology from other people that have already been developed. Um, sometimes they say people think Tesla is doing much more original work than it may be doing. And what these other self-driving companies are doing is often underrated and under-acknowledged. And I, I try to sort of balance that out on the show that we don't hear a lot of talk about what the other people are doing, but they are doing it and they are driving around um, including that self, you know, the tr the trucks in Toronto to the grocery stores that you're talking about. Yeah. No, Tesla tends to get the, the lion's share of publicity for this kind of stuff because anything to do with Tesla or Elon Musk seems to work well as a, as a clickbait title headline. Sure. So it's true. And, and all kinds of things like uh, battery storage as well. They're not the only ones doing that. Um, there was a story about CATL recently that like their profits are starting to go through the roof at CATL. I have that somewhere um, in the script, Brian. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, uh, yeah, you think that, <laughs> you think batteries aren't going places where they're already making profits like that? Come on. Yeah, uh, batteries are the new oil. So the Clean Tech can give you an example of third-party city visualizations. This is just a slightly modified Houdini city generator developed by Epic Games for the Matrix Awaken demo. Wow. Uh, available for free, by the way. Uh, Tesla hmm. just integrated their auto-labeled HD map. There's nothing proprietary other than the 3D assets uh, catching up to where others were years ago in that regard. Yeah, well, this is always the exciting thing about technology is that, um, I don't know, it just seems to get faster and faster because all these tools get developed. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just going to speed up from here. Uh, okay, so we got a story here about fusion energy, which we don't talk about very often. But fusion is kind of the opposite of fission, which is what most nuclear power plants work on now. Fusion is uh, potentially a much safer energy source. 
Um, but uh, I don't know. So far, as no one's been able to make it work. So I was a little surprised to find that they're building this... Um, plant plant building sorry i'm just looking for the the story here i've kind of lost it in my script here but um yeah so this is happening in the uk they've chosen a site for this fusion energy prototype um and the uk government is uh backing it to the tune of 220 million pounds and uh they're hoped to have a concept design ready by 2024 followed by a phase two that has detailed engineering design i don't know phase three and i don't know not targeting operations until the uh, early 2040s so oh. <laughs> this is a ways away oh. uh, i'm always fascinated by fusion because it is like the potential is incredible but i don't know that as we like to say on the show here that 220 million pounds uh from the uk government I think they just bought some solar panels for that and some batteries. Yeah, Maybe, uh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, you know, and those are available. Uh, they're picking a coal power plant as a site. Is that true for this fusion? Yeah, so I, I assume it's for the same reasons that they often do that kind of thing, is that the, all of the grid infrastructure would already be there on the site. So this is a coal plant that's no longer in use. And so they figured this would be a great place to put this uh, fusion system that, that may never work. I don't know. Yeah, it's certainly not going to save the planet if uh, the best case scenario scenario is 2040s. So Bloomberg, good old people at Bloomberg, they're always on top of all the stories that we are interested in, have uh, stated that uh, they've studied it. And EV chargers outnumber gas stations 10 to 1 in Manhattan. That is the island of Manhattan in New York City, uh, where real estate is tough so it's not easy to put up a gas station but it's actually not that hard to put up a charger you know yeah. you can put one in a parking garage and god knows there's enough of those um so new york's most densely populated borough has 320 charging stations and just 29 gas stations uh the charge point ceo was telling bloomberg that the growing popularity of evs will kill off the remaining gas stations fairly quickly i don't think you need to go far up the electric vehicle adoption curve to see gas stations deforested in <laughs> uh, that is to say wiped out of manhattan it's a question of when so yeah the crippling property prices have a lot to do with that but uh like i've yeah, said I on the show brian many times i predict it's going to be hard to buy gas we're going yeah. to switch from being, it's being hard to charge an, IV, an EV to it's hard to buy gas because they're not terribly profitable. And it's going to happen in a place like Manhattan first because, of course, everything is so dense and the, the property is so valuable. It's uh, going to be just too expensive uh, to spend all that money just for a gas station. No one's going to want to do it. And already it's not great if there's only 29 gas stations in uh, manhattan well, new yorkers as a whole shouldn't worry they say because there are still more gas stations and ev chargers across the five boroughs there are 697 gas stations dotted across the city but there's 520 electric vehicle charging stations so they're going to surpass them pretty quick i would think yeah and i assume that probably includes like some like level two kind of charging sites as well not necessarily all fast ones and most of the borough's yeah. gas stations are located north of Central Park. Did you know that? I didn't. Um, no. Huh. I guess that's the place to go if you're looking for gas. If you find yourself in Manhattan <laughs> looking for gas, it's towards Central Park. There are very few chargers above um, 110th Street for some reason. Huh. So most of these charging stations are found in parking garages. You know, cabs will be going and have started to go EV in New York City. And that trend will continue. So... The cab stations uh, or parking lots or headquarters or whatever you want to call them are going to have lots of uh, potentially fast, like, you know, the $200,000, you know, 50 kilowatt type of uh, EV chargers going in. So we'll see how that goes. Um, they're set to grow these numbers in the coming years, they say, especially as the government plans to deploy more chargers across the country. You know, Biden his charger program. It's, uh, it's crazy. But, you know, I, I read people on Facebook saying all the things that people say to them. Like um, the federal government is paying for you to charge your EV for free, things like that. You know, there's so much yeah. crap out there. I don't know what to do about it, Brian. I mean, not everybody's going to listen well, to our show. They should, obviously. Yeah. So you're thinking the podcast just isn't it's not enough. enough. We have to have T-shirts, skywriting. I don't know. <laughs> something, something big. 
Uh, you can run for prime well, minister. Well, we need to educate people. You know, I, I've never had the indication that our prime minister knows what an EV is. I, mean, I don't think he's ever driven one. But um, yeah. I don't know. That's my thoughts on that. Okay, well, speaking of chargers, the one thing we're still kind of waiting to hear more about are the kind of mega, like the Tesla mega chargers for their Tesla semi-truck. And of course, there'll be an equivalent for um, other brands as well. But uh, there was some news on that front. So finally, production has officially started on the Tesla semi-truck. Uh, Pepsi is going to get delivery of the first trucks on December 1st of this year. So they're very close. But uh, yeah, I'm really interested in the charging infrastructure part of this story because we've only heard about a couple of Tesla mega chargers, which is their brand uh, name for um, the charging stations that will charge these trucks, which presumably need a lot more power than a car. So these mega chargers can supply more power. But I assume we'll hear more on December 1st. I'm assuming Pepsi is going to maybe use them at first on some specific route, and they must already be building chargers for either end or, or something like that. But uh, we'll just keep an eye on the story because, you know, there's massive potential in transferring, um, you know, the trucking industry to electric. It's going to be a big, big deal. Uh, the trucking industry creates a lot of our pollution. What is your spec prediction for the Tesla semi supercharger, mega charger rather? Well, I can't recall the numbers, but it's, it's going to have to be, um, you know, yeah, two or three times faster than the car chargers, I would assume. I think that it'll come in under 350 kilowatts, which is existing technology, and they'll have three of them. They'll yeah. just, the battery pack will be split into three or four, and you put on three, you know, yeah. you're a trucker, you're, you're on the job, yeah. you're not a, a guy on vacation. Uh, going to the bathroom of the, the gas station washer, you're just going to plug in three things and then walk away, which is, you know, you can do that with diesel, but uh, it's not that easy. I mean, it's it's a little scary. <laughs> you can't light a cigarette. You can't, you got to kind of make yeah. sure everything's going okay. No, we should get more information soon. And I also just quickly want to mention another story that was on Electrek this week, written by Jameson Dow. And uh, the headline of the story is, I took a 2,200 mile electric road trip with no preparation, what's the big deal? So um, this is a Tesla that he took on a, on a 2200 mile road trip, kind of at the spur of the moment. And uh, I just wanted to mention it because he sort of came up with a new way of, of talking about the charging time. Because on this big trip, 2200 miles, he said they only spent 25 minutes waiting for the car to charge. And what he means by that is, Anytime they stopped and they were having a meal, for instance, and the car is charging, they didn't count that time. He only counted the time where they're, all they were doing was waiting for the car to charge. And I, I thought that was a really clever yeah. way to do it. So obviously it would have been two or three hours worth of charging, but only 25 minutes of that was them actually, you know, waiting for the car to finish charging because the rest of it is kind of like free time. It's like, well, you have to eat anyway. Mm -hmm. You have to go to the washroom anyway. So, you know... Why would you count that as charging time? So only 25 minutes of waiting uh, for a 2,200-mile road trip. Yeah. I mean, that's that's an interesting way of looking at it. I Another way I would do it is because I make a certain trip, say, to Calgary, which is a day-long trip, how, I know how, where I stop and how long I take. And I do just add time onto that. How much more time is it? And, you know, 25 minutes for money and convenience of an electric car is not that bad. And plus, you know, smell the flowers once in a while. Plus, it's only going to get better. Mm -hmm. I mean, that 25 minutes is going to be eradicated with, you know, technology that'll be on the street less than five years from now, I'm sure, if not even now. So, yeah. For yeah. Sure. All right. So some more automotive news here. So um, just a couple of weeks ago, Porsche Group split itself off from uh, the Volkswagen Group as a separate IPO and is on uh, the stock market. It took a bit of a dip right after the uh, IPO, but it sort of climbed back up again. So Porsche is now valued at 84 billion euros, making it technically worth more than Volkswagen itself. So uh, I don't know if that trend is going to continue or not, but I, I think there's some excitement around this because of the Porsche Taycan. It's, you know, not a perfect car by any means, but uh, people love driving perfect Porsches. Perfect enough for me. I'd take one. Porsche. I wouldn't take it out of bed. 
No. It's a good looking sure. car. It's a great looking car. Performance is is excellent. So um yeah, so I think, you know, the high valuation is indicative of the hopes for that. I think that the electrification of Porsche is gonna go well. Uh, Ferrari is also another kind of example to look at. Ferrari went public a few years ago um, as a way to kind of raise money for the brand. And um, that's done really well for Ferrari. It's obviously, it's a smaller player and they, they make fewer things, but they make good profits. Like Ferrari makes money on every car. And uh, so I think that's the hope is that the electrification, there's maybe some synergies with a brand like Ferrari. This worked for Ferrari. So... Um, yeah, this is what's going on with Porsche, it, you know, making it one of the most valuable companies in Europe at this As point. As an investor, have you considered it? Uh, no, I'd have to do a little bit more research and kind of see how this shakes out. You know, but. The Clean Energy Show does not provide investment device advice. No. Gambling advice, yes. Sports gambling, that sort of thing, <laughs> come right to us. But uh, how sure. about a, a little segment called uh, Elon Musk... You know, is he cuckoo? Elon Musk, cray or slay? I feel, I feel, Brian, like we lose listeners when I criticize Elon Musk. <laughs> but you have to talk about him because he's he's running the world now. He's he's left Tesla, which is your retirement depends on. I'll remind you. Yeah. And he's doing all these stupid <laughs> things, like supposedly talking to Putin about world peace, although he denied it today. Uh, but you know, there was someone who. Uh, came a news organization that said that he was and uh, the whole Kanye thing and anti-Semitism and uh, well, not directly, but I just, I'm, I'm counting the days until Elon Musk says, you know, something really, really bad. That's going to be hard for even you to take. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a list on Wikipedia of like the top 50 Twitter yeah. accounts, like, you know, the, the top, Twitter accounts and the, the many followers. And of course, Musk is getting up there very close to the top 50 million followers or something. But there's, I don't know, he's like the only one on the list that's a troll, you know? <laughs> it, it, and a certain U.S. president is, is still on the list, even though his Twitter account is no longer active. And um, so if he was still on Twitter, then there'd be two, two trolls on that list. Um, but it's, I don't know, sometimes you can't, you just can't feed the trolls. James. No, and maybe we are now, but uh, I predict bad things. That he's, he's, he's going to own Twitter and it's going to be, he's going to put unpleasant people on there that I don't want to be back on. There's going to be some terrible things said that I don't want to be said. And, uh, you know, large swaths of human beings are being targeted and I don't know how they feel. As a white male, I get to a free ride on most of this stuff. But, I mean, come on. It's a very weird thing because, of course, yeah, a lot of people think of it as a free speech issue that you shouldn't kick anyone off Twitter because everyone's deserving free speech. But, like, you have free speech on the street in your hometown. You know, everybody's kind of allowed to do what they want. Um, but not in a shopping mall. Like, a shopping mall is a private enterprise it's a private business you don't have free speech when you're in a, a shopping mall and really you know twitter facebook all these things they're more like a shopping mall than they are like the actual public square so i've always found that debate kind of weird um because of course yeah you you can't have people saying anything you want on twitter because it's nauseating and you'll revolt your customers yeah i don't know i'm not looking forward to the future i should be but i'm not you know <laughs> people are flying Getting back on airplanes, I've heard. But, you know, the pandemic seems to still be causing a lot of uh, cuckoo-ness in the world, you know. It really yeah. uh, it really messed people up. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've survived fairly well compared to some. Uh, I have not attacked any U.S. capitals or done anything like that. So, yet. Yet, I'm sure, you know. But, you know, I just... There's so much the division of the world, I, I, I just don't like it. So let's get to a segment of what James learned. The intro to this segment was lost at a computer crash of six months ago. Oh, no. So, which you have to imagine it in your mind. I learned this week, Brian, that power lines during outage events where they have one thing goes down and power lines, more power has to go through the lines that exist, that yep. when they reach 80% of their capacity and above, 
which happens in these events, then they get warm. And when they get warm, they don't start on fire, but they expand. And then that allows mm -hmm. them to sag down the longer they are and hit a tree and short wow. out and cause more power outages. Wow. So I was looking into the power outage of 2003. Were you in Toronto for that? I was. That was crazy with the whole East Coast. Yeah. Window. Was it? Did you have a night of darkness in Toronto? Uh, yeah, I think so. I can't remember how long it lasted, but I was working on a film at the time. We were making an animated film in this uh, studio down the street from me. And we'd done a, a power tap into the... Sometimes when you make a film, you can tap into the power lines and bypass the power box in, in the okay. house if, if, you, if you need more power. Um, so we thought we had caused the blackout. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how, how would you possibly do that? I don't understand. Well, it, it, we had just done it and the, po and the power went out. It, it, oh, it was closely enough related Maybe you should stop speaking right time. now. Breaking news, Brian Stockton causes the great power outage. You know, it cost them $10 billion. How do you go to a power line and bypass things? Like how? Well, power comes from the power line into yes. the house, and then it goes into your, like the power meter and your breaker yes. box. So when you're a film production, you can bypass all that when you need to, when you need well, more Well, wouldn't power. that kill you? You can't just, what are you, you're not climbing a pole for your animated film. Well, you have to have, you know, like a registered electrician do it, but it is And did possible. you need more power for your animated film? It's an animated film. Well, this is the old days when we had, you know, big movie lights and yeah, yeah, we did. We needed There was no LEDs, right? No, no, this was, this was 2003. This was forever Movie lights uh, are now LED for the most part. You can change the color and, and do things like that. And yeah, you don't have to worry about, because you know, even in film school, you're, you're worrying about you know, broke, killing breakers, you'd blow breakers all the time and the fridge would go out and people would be mad when you're shooting at their house. Yeah, because when, you know, you, you certainly, like most of the breakers in houses in North America, that you know, like 2,000 watts is the, about the biggest that you can power off your breaker box. But the movie lights are typically going to be more than 2,000 watts, so you got to bypass the breaker box. So you, you don't, rem you were too busy. You don't remember being outside, Right. Well, yeah, we were I, in... I just wonder I mean, what it I must was like, because, you know, Toronto, you never get to see the, the stars, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we probably could see the stars. I don't, I don't quite recall. But, you know, the news footage is people were on the streets because it was a hot night, and they were talking to each other and socializing in ways, and they yep. didn't know Facebook was coming and all that stuff. So, I mean, it was before those days. But even then, we were starting to sort of, you know, post 9-11, yeah. not talk to each other anymore. It was mostly kind of fun from what I remember. Like there wasn't any like widespread looting or anything. So it, it was just kind of a cool event that everyone well, I'm not share. sure I wouldn't loot right now <laughs> just to make up for uh, my car expenses. Anyway, we debuted a new segment last week called the Tweet of the Week. Yeah, I, I like certain tweets that really stand out to me during my week on Twitter which may come to an end. <laughs> we'll see. So this is from Carbon Tracker, which I highly recommend, with talk of solar panels and farmland, because, Brian, as you know, the new Prime Minister of uh, the UK says that uh, she doesn't like all the solar panels on farmland taken away from farmland, so that's raised an issue with the with the yeah, right. It, it's because she's, she's dumb. Dumb, 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 dumb. With talk of solar panels and farmland, a reminder, the land required for solar panels alone to provide all the global energy, like everything, cars, trucks, heat, everything, with just solar panels and nothing else, is 0.3% of the global land area, or 450,000 square kilometers, half a million kilometers of solar panels, with current technology. By the way, they're getting better. They'll need less land in the future, we figure. So that's, but here's the thing. That sounds like a lot, not a lot to save the planet, but it's less than the current land footprint of fossil fuel infrastructure. So all these oil people who will come up to you and say, because I heard this from my son, because he heard it from other people, yeah. so he repeated it to me. How much land is solar going to take up? How much, you know, there's a pipeline by my house goes on for hundreds of kilometers. I mean, yeah. hundreds. No, there's... There's a huge field behind your house and nothing can be built no, on it. No, the gophers can't even live there because they poison them. So, yeah. 
The gophers would much prefer solar panels, I, I guarantee you. They live in the shade, eat the grass, live in a, have a fence around them. They'd love a solar farm. In fact, if I was, came back as a gopher, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to find me a solar farm and go live there. Beautiful. We have some feedback on the show that I didn't get to last week, but uh, remember, coming up on the show is the lightning round. That's where we speed through the rest of the week's headlines. It's the two-year anniversary of the lightning round, Brian. Um, so we didn't do this one last week, but, you know, are, did we read the email of this last week? Well, that's what I thought. That's why I put that note in the script. Oh. I thought we did okay, it already. Okay, we did. Then I'm going crazy. <laughs> so? I mean, you might have to listen to it to be sure, okay. but... Well, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see this and it won't make any sense, but we'll cut this out of the audio podcast. <laughs> so we'd like to hear from you. Contact us at the Clean Energy Show. So we are at, on Gmail, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We're on Twitter. We're on TikTok, where we have videos blowing up as we speak. And our handle there is Clean Energy Pod. That's Twitter and TikTok. You can also DM us on Twitter or anywhere you like. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel, The Clean Energy Show, or leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. And, you know, we had a, a Speakpipe voicemail last week, and I said that we would uh, read the guy's birthday, Sean in Ireland, in, in, in Belfast. Yep. Was it Dublin or Belfast? I can't remember. Dublin. Mm, not sure. Dublin. Belfast. Damn it. Ireland. Um, it's probably a huge difference. He's getting mad at us right now, but I'm thinking, of course he doesn't want his birthday on the show. I mean, what are you going to do? His mother's maiden oh. name too? Or are you just going to give out personal information <laughs> to the masses? Of course not. Yeah. So yeah. Well, happy birthday, whenever it is. Uh, so Brian's the second anniversary of the lightning round. So let's get retro. The clean energy show lightning round. The lightning round hits James against Brian in a flurry of headlines from this week's news. Let's begin here now, James Woodingham. You remember this? It used to be a contest. There'd be buzzers. <laughs> if you did respond with a, some sort of a reply. Remember the good old days, Brian? Missed, remember them? Yeah, the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> so here we go. We mentioned this earlier. CATL expects a net profit of $1.37 billion in the third quarter. That's a net. So just this in the third quarter. This is a net quarter. profit. Net. Yeah. Profit. Yeah. Batteries. No, they're going to shriek away and not build 10 million more gigafactories. Come on, people. Carbon tractor. Car carbon tracker. U.S. gas imports would be 13% lower. UK. What did I say? U.S. Okay. Damn it. Carbon Tracker says that UK gas imports would be 13% lower if successive conservative-led governments had not, quote, unquote, cut the green crap over the past <laughs> decade. So, yeah, if uh, we, you know, we praised Boris for doing a few good things and supporting wind, but ultimately they did cut a lot of green crap, as they called it. And But now, if they hadn't done that, 13% lower um, imports of gas from Russia and, and just overall, 13% less if they hadn't done that, but they did. So you're wrong to do that. It's just wrong. Inside EVs, the Nissan mm -hmm. Leaf sales noted the worst third quarter ever. Um, you know why? I'm going to guess why. why? The, the Nissan Leaf doesn't compete anymore, for one thing. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have uh, liquid cooling. Uh, you can't, you know, charge the battery three times on the highway consecutively. You can't use it in Arizona without worry of degradation. And people who are loyal to the Nissan brand have the area to buy. So they're buying that. Yeah. They're not buying the Leaf. So there was only 1,276 Leaf sales. That's almost 46% less than in Q3 of last year and the lowest third quarter result ever. Remember when Carlos... Um, Gone, gosh, gone. Gone. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. He's now Carlos in jail <laughs> in Spain or somewhere. Yeah, I've lost track of that story. Yeah, he was corrupt. He had, didn't he have to get out of Japan in a yeah, crate yeah, or yeah. something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was interesting. It was interesting. He, he snuck himself <laughs> out of Japan, but he, um, he, yeah, he, he started the program and said we're going to sell millions of them. Or at the very, this is in the documentary "Who Killed the Electric Car" or the, the "Revenge of the Electric Car." This the follow-up documentary. Uh, yeah. He said that, but then he also said that, well, we'll be ready if EVs take off. Well, 
they're kind of not. <laughs> With two mm -hmm. two offerings that they're are not, not, not huge value properties. And like, how is the Aria going to compare to the Chevrolet uh, Equinox, which is 30,000 US? Mm -hmm. How is it going to compare? Now, it's a pretty stripped bare bones unit probably you're getting for 30,000, but that's a big price difference. Like, it's not even... You know, the size is, is complimentary. It's, it's pretty much the same. So the Leaf shares of Nissan's total volume has decreased to 0.9% of all Nissan sold, which is not good at all. Um, yeah, for old time's sake, that's for not saying anything. Thank you. <laughs> From Reuters, nuclear power is looking extremely expensive compared to renewable energy. And the cost of generating solar ranges from $36 to $44 per megawatt hour, while onshore wind power comes in at $29, a little bit less, to $56 per megawatt hour. Nuclear, $112 to $189. It's ridiculous. Yeah, that's not competitive at Carla all. Carla Thunberg was on a show getting interviewed today. Saying, asking about nuclear, and she says, "No, if it exists, that's a good idea. Don't shut it down. Shutting down is bad idea, especially if you're replacing it with coal, which they are. But you know, the wisdom yes. of the youth. That is a big. That's four times as much right now, and it, the 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 difference is going to widen. From EcoWatch, the growth in wind and solar in the first half of 2022 prevented a four percent increase in fossil fuel generation." Yeah, so we tend to need more power every year, uh, but this year it was completely offset by the renewables that were created. So that's it fantastic. It is fantastic, isn't it? Fast fact. It's time for a clean energy show. Fast fact. Uh, solar energy and wind energy generated more than 10% of Ontario's total electricity supply in 2021. 10%, Brian, 10. That's solar yeah. and wind. We're not talking hydro here. Solar and wind, ten percent. Yeah. Do you know what it is here? Yeah, the Ontario. Well, it's, it's less. It's the Ontario grid is uh, pretty clean. It's getting there. It's getting there. The world's largest offshore wind farm is going to get even larger, and will provide enough electricity to power twenty-one percent of all UK homes with a five gigawatt output. That's like five nuclear reactors. So yeah, the the, the wind farm, the biggest one in the world, is off the coast of the UK. And it's going to get even bigger and 20, it's one in five, more than one in five homes uh, will be powered, can be powered by wind. The, just like that. And we're not talking yeah, about that's 2040. We're talking about right now. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. Shell is the new official partner for the next eight years for British cycling. And a lot of people, Brian, are not happy about it. <laughs> they, they are sponsoring mm -hmm. the, well, they just call it British Cycling, but it's the Cycling Association for Sports Cycling. And uh, they don't see it as a good brand fit. And no. everybody else who might want to sponsor Brady Cycling is running away. So that's not good. Canadian doctors are exposing a blatant greenwashing attempt by Canada Gas Association. This is the commercials that we have to watch on cable news in Canada. They are filing a $10 million complaint against an ad campaign promoting natural gas as clean, affordable, sustainable energy. How is it sustainable? Sorry to wake you up there, <laughs> but what the hell? Uh, that's clean? Where do they get these things from? How is natural gas clean? Yeah. Cleaner than coal. Cleaner than coal, it. sure. Well, we're not living in, you know... Uh, 1800s uh, London, you know, this is, uh, mm -hmm. come on. When gas is worse than coal, you know, and it pollutes the air, the water, the lungs was carcinogens. Why, why are they doing this? Why? Yeah. Uh, that's from the energy mix. To reach net zero emissions by 2050 and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, investment in renewable energy sources must surpass finance flows to fossil fuels by a factor of four. Over the next decade, says BNEF, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. So, yeah, they're, well, I can see it happening naturally anyway. Do you have any argument with that, that it's going to happen that way? No, that sounds about right. From Professor Peter Strachan, solar energy saved Europeans $29 billion this summer. 
solar alone, $29 billion through all of Europe because of uh, cheaper electricity. Yeah, and of course, there's been very high energy prices in Europe this summer. So without the solar, it would have cost everybody $29 billion more. And Brian, that's a lot of money. I don't care yeah. how much Tesla stock you have. You have to admit, $29 billion is a lot of money, and it's about 29 times what I need to pay off my bills. So we found out uh, from the floods in Florida that Teslas automatically open their windows and doors if there's water detected inside the car. Did you see that story? No, uh, I didn't. Apparently, cars that got flooded popped open the doors and windows. <laughs> but... Uh, they, apparently, they've rumored to have this feature for 10 years. Audi and Porsche are also rumored to have had the safety feature for a while. Now, here in Saskatchewan, we drive along farm roads. And then we look at yeah. our cell phone, roll the car, and end up in a dugout, which is a pond sure. made for the farm of water. Yeah. And people drown. It happens every year. Yeah. And some people, in fact... Uh, some people carry special tools for breaking their window because you can't open the door to the car. That's the problem. The mm -hmm. door won't open because of the difference in pressure until your car is filled yeah. completely with water. And by then it's like, if this doesn't work, you're dead. Uh, so uh, there's even been a story of somebody who carried one of those tools and actually ended up using it a couple of years ago and got out that way. And yeah. my, my wife bought something at Costco with these flashlights because our son's on the highway a lot, bought him that yeah. and has one of those tools built in. You know, for if he breaks down or, or something like that, he's already used it once. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting that they would do that. And it seems like all cars, you know, that's a great safety feature because that's something that I actually think about and we thought about with our kids. Yeah. So it reduces the pressure so that you should be able to, even though there's going to be water rushing in, you should be able to then yeah. open the door. And, and sometimes, down. you know, it's, it's different if you have, uh, well, nobody has a manual window anymore, you know, the ones that you crank. But the idea yep. is that these will do that, and the water is detected inside the car, not outside the car, by the way. Siemens has set a record with their SG-14 offshore wind turbine prototype. So I'm assuming that's 14 megawatts, the SG-14, and that's why it has 14 in it. The turbine has produced 359 megawatt hours within a 24-hour time period. That is the most power one turbine has ever produced over this duration and that is enough energy to drive in an EV 1.8 million kilometers made from one turbine in one 24-hour period. 1.8 million kilometers of driving a mid-sized electric car. That's and finally this week, there is a thing where you get over-the-air updates on a Tesla. It hooks into your Wi-Fi in your home. It updates the software like, a, say, your phone operating system would update overnight. And sometimes you have better cars, yep. sometimes you have better performance. Like uh, they'll unleash a, more of the battery to you yep. or more of a, the, the uh, zero to 60 time has got a, a point shaved off of it or something like that. Well, they're doing. Yeah, I get them all the time. They're doing this and with an e-bike. <laughs> uh, Okai has released an over-the-air performance update for their Ranger e-bike. So that must be an expensive e-bike if it's got over-the-air updates. But apparently... It is a 50% performance boost uh, thanks to an over-the-air update. So, <laughs> that's just amazing. Well, maybe Ooh. they can get around regulations that way because there's, there's regulations in certain places about the amount of power. So you could sell it at one particular yeah, power maybe. level. I don't know. That's uh, our time for this week. We're going to leave you now, but we'll be back again next week. We love to hear from you again. Cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Send us an email right now. Let us know what you're thinking. Twitter, TikTok, Clean Energy Pod. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel, et cetera, et cetera. If you're new to the show, and I know you are, some of you, subscribe to the podcast so you get our show every week because we're here every damn week, Brian. We're there. We're there for our people. So subscribe to the podcast yeah. app and get them every week. We'll see you next time.